notification. Yes. Um, okay, I think we can go ahead and start. Okay. Let's pray. Father God, we lift up this time to you, Lord, and we pray um, that this would just be a blessing, that your Holy Spirit would just fill this, this space uh, in this church and online here with all these women, and to anyone who's watching this recording after, Lord, we pray that our words and our stories and what we share would be glorifying to you and encouraging and uplifting to others. And we just pray for openness and vulnerability. Uh, this is a safe place of our sisters where we can share and learn from each other and feel encouraged and grow from hearing each other's stories, Lord. I just pray for anyone watching God who is struggling right now or has struggled, that they would know that they're not alone that there is a community surrounding them, Lord, and there's help available. And we just pray that by hearing other people's experiences, they would feel emboldened to speak up and get help for themselves as well. And we just lift up all of this in the name of your son, Jesus, who understands our pain, God, and your Holy Spirit, who is our comforter and our strength. We lift all of this up to you, Lord, in your name, amen. Thank you. So, um, I guess we can just start off with um, where are you currently at with struggling with, with where's your mental health right now? That's the first question I wanna ask it. Um, what, if you're not struggling now, what has been a struggle in the past? Angie, would you like to start us? I can. Okay. Okay. Um, where I'm at now, I'm I'm well now, but I I can say um, I would say like leading up to Sunday, I was really struggling for a couple of weeks, and I couldn't understand why I had so much anxiety, so much depression. Like every morning, I would wake up. Now this was like a two week span. And um, I started renewing my mind and God reminded me of, um, I was taking like magnesium every day and that was helping me. And also I started back eating sugar and flour and that, that's what's really, that's what really caused me to have the depression over the, over the two weeks. Um, but <laughs> it's so weird because right away i took the magnesium that night and right away like the next day no anxiety mm -hmm. at all and i was like i didn't realize how much magnesium worked and then i stopped of course i stopped eating sugar and flour again and i just feel well i felt felt well like i started um last i think wednesday and every day i just felt well mm -hmm. so this felt better so that's um now what was the second question so the second question and i'm so glad you're doing well and it's like um, let me see this so they can hear us too um i'm so glad that you're doing well and and i think for me just hearing that is like sometimes we don't consider how just like the way that we eat and sometimes our bodies are deficient in something and how that can impact our moods and depression and anxiety and things like that but just going back over your years what have um have you struggled with anxiety in the past have you struggled with depression in the past what does that look like if you have okay um yeah and like I, I feel like i've always had anxiety and depression but i never dealt with it until um, 2018 i started i started looking for a therapist and i couldn't find a christian therapist so i i got you know i got insurance so i started going to a this woman at Northwestern, and she's not a Christian. As a matter of fact, I think she believes in Eastern um, meditation or something like that. But I didn't know at the time. And this lady helped me. And what she did was, I, I just feel like she applied 
the renewing of the mind strategy. I already knew how to renew my mind. All she did every week was help me, like remind me to use the tools of renewing your mind because God blessed me with the renewing of the mind process in 2015, but I was never uh, consistent with it. But going to therapy helped me to be consistent with it. Now, I don't recommend a, a, a person like I don't recommend like a secular ther therapist unless you are strong in your faith, mm -hmm. because she could have easily, easily introduced me to yoga or anything like that. She could have easily uh, introduced me to that. But because Christ is my life and every time I would go to her, I remember talking to her about Gideon. I remember talking to her about the armor of God. It was like I was talking to her about the Lord. And I remember um, one time I was like, man, I shouldn't be going. Like I felt, I felt some type of way. I was like, I shouldn't be going to a secular therapist. And I had prayed about it. So then <laughs> I got a Christian therapist and I went to her once and I heard the Lord say, go back to your secular therapist. Because she was really, really helping me. Every week, she would give me um, a, a task to do. And what I would do was apply the word. I would apply the word to whatever she would give me. And that's, that's like really how I got my freedom. So I went through it. I went to her like almost every week for um, 2018. Yeah. And then when 2019 came, I had to stop because I had um, the jury, the jury duty, right? And so what I realized is that I needed that therapy before I went to the grand jury because the grand jury every week I had to, uh, I had to sit on a, on a jury of cases of murder and just all the stuff that's happening in the city of Chicago. I mean, gun violence. I mean, people, you know, just, just, just killing just so much. And every week I had to, I was renewing my mind. I was calling out to the Lord, but that therapy caused me to uh, continue with it on my own. Give you the tools. Yep. Yeah. It, it really, it really equipped me to do it. And even now, like, I feel like we, we have, we have to renew our mind to the day we die. That's just, and that's therapy. It's cognitive behavior therapy. We know where your mind is. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Megan, so where are you currently in your mental health journey? And, and second question, it's like, what have you struggled with in the past? Sure. So I have pretty much for as long as I remember, I struggled with pretty chronic anxiety. I, um, like remember even just from like a small child, like five or six, I would have like very, very vivid, repetitive nightmares. And um, even just experiencing a lot of physical symptoms of anxiety of like a tight chest and heart palpitations. And my gut was destroyed, <laughs> eating food made me sick and things like that. Um, so where I am currently is a long ways from that, but it's taken a long time to get there, I would say. So right now, currently, I do see a therapist regularly. Um, she's a Christian therapist. I also am on, actually, I'm on medication for anxiety, um, recommended by my doctor. Um, and it took, this is probably the third medication I have tried. And I'm also on my third therapist. So that was, I think that's something too that I didn't really realize going into this because for the longest time I felt that it was for some reason wrong for me to seek help and I can kind of talk about that later too um, but when I did eventually seek help I kind of thought it would just be an immediate fix and my first counselor was not a good fit and my second counselor was helpful but wasn't a great fit and it really took um, I think last year is when I started seeing my current therapist and we like instantly clicked and I really felt that connection and she was super helpful and she really had great tools and it, but it took a long time to get there and it can be really discouraging. And so I think that is something that needs to be talked about more too. It's just that it's okay if it's a process yeah. and it takes a while to get there. And so 
I think looking at myself now, while I still struggle, um, I have so many more tools in my tool belt to actually help and deal with that and manage. And I feel like I have a better support system. And so it's, it's kind of neat to look back and be like, wow, I used to like have panic attacks on the daily and that's not happening anymore. And that can be really encouraging. Thank you both for sharing. Um, I think part of the reason why I kind of wanted to continue the conversation of um, mental health is like the destigmatization because some people, therapy, depending on what background you come from, in my community, African American community, like therapy is not something that is encouraged, it's frowned upon, it's like just do what you got to do and keep it moving. So taking the step to actually go to therapy is huge, but then also medication, especially in the Christian community, some people are like, oh, it's totally fine. And other people see it as like a lack of faith or whatever. And it's not. And I, I love how you shared, like it hasn't been easy and you've had three different medications and three different therapists, but God has given you progress, which is, which is great. Um, I think for me, currently mental health, I am a way better, a lot better than I was in the past. And I think, um, I guess there's a theme for us. We've all been in therapy and therapy has been a, a really a huge turning point for me. And um, growing up, I, a lot of people in the church know my father abandoned me when I was in the second grade. And that was never talked about um, in that moment. And I was, I had to just process really heavy emotions by myself in an unhealthy way so um kind of like isolation uh depression because depression can look different for different people so I think a lot of times I didn't realize I was struggling with depression because I I hate to say it was I felt like high functioning yep. in a sense but I definitely had that and uh, a couple of years ago um our church is about almost like five and a half years old oh well, actually almost six <laughs> and I was had just had my son Judah we had just planned the church and a lot of anger about life was just there and I I couldn't I could function but I, I was like waking up every day and I would just be like oh my gosh I don't want to do this like it wasn't that I wanted to commit suicide or anything it was just like I I don't want to face what's in front of me. I don't want to deal with my kids. I know my life seems good, but I'm just angry and I have a lot of resentment. So for me, it hit, I was scared of what would happen if I continued on in that way. And I told my husband, I was like, I need to go get help. And it was, it was kind of like the Lord dealing with me because as a pastor's wife, uh, having been like in a leader in the church in different forms over the years, so easy to tell other people, go ahead and get help. Like go get counseling. And the Lord's like, when are you going to take your own advice? When are you going to do that? So just, and it's scary. It's really frightening to be like, to first admit like that you need help. And if you struggle with perfectionism, like me that, oh my gosh, so shocker, you're not perfect. That That's hard. But then to actually take that step to, to find someone. And um, for me, I prayed and the Lord did give me one therapist that I've been seeing for the last, what, three, I don't even know how many years. And it has been just the resounding theme of having these tools and being able to really um, examine why I'm thinking the way that I am and dealing with past trauma has been super helpful. And if y'all have questions too, just feel free to jump in. But one of the questions that I want to deal with, because I just shared, you know, when, when I was a little girl, my dad left, that's a pretty traumatic thing. And that's another thing. I didn't realize that was trauma until I was in therapy mm -hmm. because I, you know, I was never, for me, like I never dealt with like sexual abuse or anything. So I was just like, that's trauma. But having my dad leave me, oh, no, that's not trauma. And I, I can remember when my therapist in the session, she's like, well, you know, your trauma. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, what do you mean trauma? Like, what are you talking about right now? Um, and then just having to like grieve that and 
be like, wow, I do have trauma and there's nothing wrong with that. Like destigmatizing trauma because mm. we all have trauma in some way. And I think like the world can teach us and even the church can teach us to categorize it, to be like, well, since you had this happen, this is definitely trauma. But sometimes trauma could be like a child that has two healthy parents where they, there was a moment where they just felt insecure, unseen, or they didn't feel like their, their parent showed up in a really important way. That can be traumatic for them. But if they don't realize it or people around us like downplay trauma, they're not able to heal. So anyways, how was mental health handled in your house growing up? And how was it handled? Well, let, just answer that question first. This is my problem. I asked so many questions at one time, but Megan, you can start. I think I really resonate with that um, because something that held me back from seeking help for years was this belief that I didn't deserve help because I hadn't truly been through something horrible in my mind. Um, and it wasn't even like a sense of like hatred towards myself as much as it just was, well, I can recognize that someone suffering from sexual assault would need therapy. But I felt guilty recognizing that I had experienced trauma because in my mind, I didn't deserve to feel traumatized because other people had it worse. You know, I had two parents. I, you know, didn't suffer from something horrible happening, um, violating like rape or assault or something like that. And so in my mind, it was ungrateful for me to seek help because I was somehow like looking at my past and acknowledging brokenness. And I think what really helped me was just through reading scripture and praying and talking with mentors and understanding that we live in a broken world and none of us are going to escape this world without scars and without experiencing brokenness from other people and experiencing generational brokenness and harm in our families. And it really also wasn't until I went to therapy and started unpacking things that I understood, no, I did experience trauma as a child. A lot of that trauma was uh, with family members being chronically ill and church hurt with, and spiritual abuse and things that happened there. And that was helpful because I could understand why my body and my mind seemed to just like have a knee jerk response and react in ways that I didn't understand. And something that was really helpful for me was a therapist talking to me about implicit memories and just how as children, we form implicit memories from hurtful experiences. And those memories, we can't cognitively recall them. They're not an ex explicit memory, but our body remembers them. And when we're faced in a situation that triggers that memory, we might not cognitively recall it. So we don't realize what's happening, but we'll respond, our body responds. And so that's something that's so helpful about therapy and why I recommend it so strongly is even just understand what could trigger me and why is my body responding this way and how do I retrain myself to understand how to actually respond in a way that corresponds with reality that I'm not in danger and I don't need to go into a fight or flight mode. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, the question was the family, like how did our family, yeah. well, I can't, I can't recall therapy, um, mental health being mentioned at all in my family, in no way, form or fashion. But I remember when I was little, my mom used to say, um, I know that my mom was bipolar now, like as I'm, you know, as I'm learning about, you know, uh, different mental challenges, I know that my mom's bipolar because she used to be happy one day and then she used to be up and down. And so she, what is that? Oh, um, we're just um, going to mute you, Sharika. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. So um, 
she she would just do all, all you know all this different type of stuff when I was growing up and um but I remember her saying I gotta take my nerve pills and no and I was like what is a nerve pill and I didn't find out till I was an adult that that, that, that was medicine for depression mm. that was medicine for anxiety so she took medicine but I never remember her saying that she went to a therapist or anything like that. I didn't start really hearing about therapy until I was probably about, I don't know, 26, 27. And because of, you know, being um, black, like black people don't do that. Like, you know, that's like you going to the crazy doctor. That's That was the whole thing. I'm not crazy, so I don't need to see a psychiatrist. I don't need to go to therapy. That was the whole thing. It was like, it was the whole thing was, you're soft. Yeah. You're, you know, you, you don't need, it. actually, I can remember, I can recall some of my family members saying, that's a white, white people do that. Black people don't do that. Yeah, that is a, a thing within our community. Yeah, that was like, no, we don't do that. And so, um, yeah, so that's my experience as a, in my family. Thank you so much for sharing that. Same thing, you know, for me coming, living in Philadelphia and just, I think like for black people who have a lot of racial trauma too. And it'd be interesting, honestly, I'm gonna ask you about like white culture because I'm not white, <laughs> you know, like I wanna, and our church is very diverse. So I think it's good to just like say like, hey, how does your culture handle, handle this? And what are some of the stigmas and the challenges? Because as we as sisters in Christ come alongside of each other, it's good to know those things. Mm -hmm. So for, for um, me, you know, my mom was a teenage mom. So like she was 15 when she had me. So by the time my dad left, she's still in her early 20s. So when I look back, I'm like, my grandparents weren't the ones that are like, let's sit down and talk about your feelings. So my mom didn't really have those tools for me um, to, to explore that. And then I think when I um, became a Christian and started going to church, uh, counseling was like, yes, biblical counseling. But then it became this like, I don't know, like almost like Pharisee self-righteous thing of like, well, this is the right type of counseling and then this is not. So like Angie, when you shared secular counseling, sometimes it was like, well, if I go to, I remember in college, my, my um, advisor was like, I think you need to see someone. And I didn't tell anybody at my church at all. I went to like a school psychologist and I was like, I'm not saying anything to anybody yeah. because I don't want to hear anything about it. And <laughs> I, did I didn't even stay with it long because I, because of the shame around that, mm -hmm. you know? And then I didn't connect with my counselor, but I didn't have the language to say, you know, it's okay that I didn't connect, but maybe there's a better fit. You know, I didn't have that. Um, and then I got to the point, to be frank, even when I started going to counseling at Chicago West, there was a lot of shame around that because heck, I'm a pastor's wife and I'm supposed to have it all together. That's crap. We don't, we're human. Like we have struggles like everybody else. So it got to the point where God had to break me from people pleasing and fear of man and be like, you know what? I don't really care what these folks think about me. I need help and I'm gonna go get it. And honestly, I think when I started telling my husband about it, he was supportive, but I think there was even a side of him that was like, maybe you should try this counselor, maybe you should try that. And he was being helpful, but I was like, listen, I don't have, I can't sit around for three months. Like I need help now, I need help now. So I wanna ask this other question. So in your journey with mental health, how has it impacted your journey with God? Like where, what did you used to think about God? Um, what are some things you used to think about God that has transformed? What are some revelations that God has given you on your mental health journey of healing? That's a good question. The Holy Spirit gave me that one. <laughs> so this could be hours and hours and hours. So <laughs> make it really short. Um, but I, so to kind of start in a little different of an area, 
the culture I grew up in was very, very conservative Christian. This is not to bash them in any way, shape, or form. But I think it's common in those communities to have a lot of shame surrounding seeking help for mental health, um, especially when it comes in forms of therapy outside of like going and talking to your pastor and seeking medication and actually going to like a psychiatrist or a doctor. Um, so I really had this belief formed in me that if I would seek help in those ways, that meant I wasn't trusting God and that there was something wrong in my relationship with God because the Bible says, do not be anxious about anything and to just rejoice in the Lord. So why can't I just get it together? And it really, I think what the Lord has taught me as I've walked with him is that that's a workspace righteousness, that if I have to clean myself up before I go to God, that I'm not depending on the grace of Jesus and that the Lord works in medicine and he works in other people, especially professionals who are trained to help us and refusing those measures was kind of a point of pride for me in a way, not that it is for everyone, but for me, because I think I also relate to you in the sense of, I was very hyper functioning, not that I was functioning, but right. that the way my anxiety presented was in being very almost OCD, like of having lists and having everything together. And seemingly from the outside perspective, I was a very put together person, but inwardly I'm crumbling and not keeping it together and falling apart. And I think we only really look to people who like can't get out of bed and are struggling to keep a job as someone who would need help. Whereas someone like me, who was a straight A student, didn't need help. And that's not true. <laughs> and so I think my relationship with God has really grown from one where it was very, I need to clean myself up. And there's a lot of shame in approaching God in my messiness and approaching him with tears and feeling broken and in the midst of a panic attack that felt shame. And so for the longest time, there was a lot of, I think, distance. God felt very far away. He was someone who was watching everything happen to me, but wasn't intervening from my perspective, what I felt. And I think there was a lot of shame in that of just feeling like, well, if I just prayed more, or if I just practiced spiritual disciplines or read my Bible more, this will go away. And it's only really recently now that I feel like I've just started really truly embracing the grace of Jesus and his sacrifice and in how beautiful it is that he is our high priest who intercedes for us from a place of experience of knowing what it's like to be a broken human and that God is my father and when he's looking down on me and I trip and fall he doesn't laugh he doesn't scoff and he doesn't feel shame or disgust towards me he feels compassion and I remember one time I was listening to a sermon at church and the pastor asked, if you could see God's face right now, what would his expression towards you be? And immediately I thought disgust. And really what I was doing, I was projecting my own self-hatred onto God and somehow that's how he felt towards me. And I remember that just thought immediately popped in my head and the pastor continued and he said he would be smiling because the Lord delights in you as his child. And I think that's really where I've come to a place in my walk with the Lord. So it's been a journey. It can be really hard when you have those struggles. Um, I think uh, as I'm listening to y'all and I'm listening to like the struggles that y'all have with perfection and lists, right lists and everything. I'm like, I was, I was t the total opposite. I, I was always told by my grandfather, because I used to, like, I used to have to go to my grandparents' house every weekend, and my grandfather was an alcoholic, and he used to always tell me, you will never amount to nothing, wow. and I believe that, so I believed it so much so that insecurity, rejection, it just took over my life, 
and I could see the failure. Like, it was like, because I was told that I was going to fail, that I would never amount to nothing. It was like, that's how I lived. That's how I lived my life. Like, I'm going to die anyway. I'm going to die young anyway. Like, that's how I lived my life until God saved me at 22. I lived like that. So I did whatever. Like, it was like, whatever. But then after God saved me, I mean, I used to read my Bible so much. Like, I would read my Bible two hours a day, an hour going to work and an hour coming home. And that word, it was like God transformed my heart through that word. It wasn't even like, it, I hadn't even got, got to therapy yet because I had to, I had to get to a place where I was, where I just felt like a normal person, mm -hmm. where I felt like I was going to survive because every day I didn't, I just thought, you know, I had this, uh, I had no value of life. You know, I, you know, I just, it was just horrible. It was just horrible. But like just recently, I would say in the last five years, um, well, maybe like the last 10 years, I would say that um, God has been gradually like renewing my mind and making me, um, making me uh, realize my identity in him. And I think the biggest, the huge, the biggest uh, barrier that God has broken down is insecurity. Insecurity concerning people pleasing, insecurity concerning rejection. Rejection was huge. Rejection was huge. Now I look back, I am like, I am accepting and beloved. Yeah. Like that is, that is the way I live now. But for years, it was like all of my life. Y'all, I felt reject. I think I was rejected from the womb. And the reason why I say that, because my mom, she was 15 and her, and my granddad, the same, the same man who tore me down, tore my mom down when she was pregnant with me. That's not, yeah, it's generational. And um, that's why I say I was rejected from the womb because my mom used to weep and weep and weep as she was pregnant with me. Like, I felt that. I felt that. I bet you I felt that as, a, as it being in her womb. So God has really brought me to a place, just to a, a a place where I know I'm loved. And that's only been within the last 10 years. I will be 48. Um, I will be 48 on the 5th. And I'm just now, you know, just in embracing the love of God, just embracing my identity in him. It took a long time. It took all, you know, just being in the word and in therapy and just God peeling back layers of hurt, layers of trauma. Because even as a child, just being abused from maybe about three, sexually abused from about three to about 12, just consistently. And I'm just like, I used to ask the Lord. Now I've always prayed. I've always had a praying spirit, even before I was saved. And I used to ask God, like, why is, why am I drawn to people to abuse me? Mm -hmm. It was like, I was a magnet mm -hmm. for it. And I don't, you know, those are things that I don't believe, but anymore, but for years, I believe that. Mm -hmm. I believe that. So yeah, I'm just, so what, what I would say just to wrap all this up is that right now I read the Bible differently. I believe it's, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, we read the Bible, we pray, but we don't be believing. You better talk about it. We don't even be believing. <laughs> we are, like God just told us something. We don't, we don't be believing. But today that word is a, it's like, it's, it's like a, a double-edged sword for real in my life. It is truly real. When I read it, I experience God. You know, and it's, I don't know, that's just, that's just the, the change. It is very living. It is very living. Like, y'all, I'm reading through Genesis and woo, I'm just <laughs> like, what in the world is so scandalous? But just seeing God 
through every part of it. So thank you both for sharing too. Um, wow. They just thank you for your vulnerability in, in that. Um, I think for me, because of my abandonment, abandonment, did I say that right? <laughs> if I didn't, sorry, y'all. Um, my abandonment. Um, I had a lot of trust issues with God, with people, and particularly a lot of anger with God, because I felt like, well, even when I was a little girl, I never doubted that God existed. Like before I became a Christian, I just knew like God and Jesus existed, but I didn't necessarily understand that whole personal relationship, understanding that I was a sinner in need of a savior. But I think I had a lot of anger because I was like, God, you could have intervened, but you didn't. Like, why did you choose for me to go fatherless? And even when I became a Christian, still wrestling with that of, I mean, my sal salvation came at a time where I felt so worthless. And then I just, like the Lord, the Holy Spirit just started working in me. And I remember reading, Ooh, every time I tell this part, I get so emotional, Psalm 139. And realizing that like I was not a mistake and even though I didn't understand why I had to go fatherless that God God created me and that it was good and I was made in his image and that just blew me away it's still even even now when I think back I can't help but to be overwhelmed by God's love for me and even though I understood Psalm 139, I still struggled to believe his full goodness for me. Like I did feel like, you know how you use that example of you saw God's face and it's like disappointment because out of that abandonment, I acted out and really, you know, I was promiscuous. I just, I was doing a lot of things out of my hurt and um, just never, you know, feeling, not understanding, even though my, God allowed, he gives us choice. He gives us all choice. And he gave my father, my birth father, a choice. And my father chose to abandon me. And it took me a long time. And, and I think it was like a combination of like being in the word, going to therapy, like going to therapy and just really, really getting in the word and understanding like the stories in the Bible helped a lot because you start to see, oh my gosh, I can resonate with yeah. like Hagar when she was, we've been talking about Hagar yeah. a lot. Like I can understand what it feels like to be cast off and in the desert yeah. and crying. And then God sees me and he shows up. So for me, through all of those things, God started to reveal that he is my father. And I remember it started around that time when that song, Good, Good Father, came out, I was so mad. I would be in all transparency. At Chicago West, when we were at the high school, we would be singing the song and I would be sitting in the front having a whole argument with God during the worship. Like, oh yeah, you're a good, good father. Well, then why did you do this? And like, just arguing with him. And God showed up and showed out on me because there's a whole nother story from the other day, but he gave reconciliation with my, earth, my, my birth father. But anyway, he started to teach me like, I'm your father. Amen. I'm your father. And I've always been with you. And, and the things that happened to you, just like with you, like your abuse, that grieved him. Yeah. He did not, he wasn't rejoicing in that. And he wasn't rejoicing in the fact that I was abandoned. So start, you know, you talked about belief. It sounds so crazy, but I started to be like, okay, I'm going to build this trust. It's like my kids when I'm like at the pool and my little Judah were like, jump in. And he's like, I don't know about this. <laughs> They're like, you got a life jacket on, you're not going to drown. But like jump in my arms. And he's like very cautious. And he, he builds up the courage to do it. And then the next time he's still a little cautious, but then he, he's like, okay. And then now he's just like, woo, that's how it was with me in the Lord, where it was like, I don't really know if you're trustworthy, but I'm gonna try this thing out. And, and then he, he's faithful. 
Mm. He's faithful. He may not show up the way that we want, but he does show up in the way that he, he, he intended. And um, so for me, encountering God, like through this whole process was just really understanding, like, you know, I spoke to the women at our women's event and I was like, I used to think that I was an orphan and I'm not. I'm no longer, I'm not a spiritual orphan. Like I'm adopted by the king. And understanding that has transformed how I interact with people, how I pray, um, my hope, you know, how my identity, I no longer take on, I'm not holding on to the shame for my pr promiscuity. I'm like, Jesus died for that. He washed me with that. I don't even hold on to the sin that I committed five minutes ago when I repent I'm like oh it's covered all right let me get back up that's huge for me that is so huge for me to keep moving forward and and to keep running back to the father's arms and knowing that he's never ever gonna push me away there's nothing that can separate me from him so something that I just said kind of made me think of like I said, you know, it transformed the way that I act with people. Yeah. So I just kind of want to hear like how, just how did your mental health when you were not, when I don't want to say when you weren't working on it, but when it was at its height and it seemed unbearable. Cause like we said on um, the counselor said on Sunday, sometimes you really, because of those pathways. And if y'all haven't listened to the, um, the service, please go back and listen. But the doctors, the therapists were talking about there's pathways that our brains create because of a certain thought pattern of the things that happen. So sometimes someone really can't in that moment immediately pivot. So I know personally it has harmed <laughs> those times of why depression and it has come up in anger. It's harmed my kids. It's harmed my husband in many ways. Um, so if you feel comfortable, could you just talk? and share about just the journey of mental health and your personal relationships and things that you've learned. Yeah, I know for me, that was something I never thought about. Um, I thought my anxiety and mental health struggles was kind of just like my own cross to bear. I never really thought about how it could be affecting those around me um, until I would say 2019. So 2019, my anxiety started getting really, really bad again. It kind of, I would say throughout my life, there was kind of like, it was more like this. It wasn't just a straight line <laughs> getting worse. There were times it was kind of better just because of circumstances. And then other times where it was really, really bad. And I remember a moment because I was newly married. I was only married for about a year at that point. And I was sitting on our bedroom floor having a meltdown about, I don't even remember, and John came in and just ever so gently said, have you thought about counseling? And I blew up at him. I exploded. I was so angry. Like, how dare you bring that up to me? Like, this is my problem. But I wasn't seeing how much it was hurting him to, one, see me in that state constantly, but two, to have to bear the burden of just being my husband and helping and walking alongside me when I was constantly anxious. And so that's a moment I always think of because we can like look back and laugh at it, but at the time it was very painful. And then at the end of 2019, I was in my brother and sister-in-law's wedding and my anxiety was so bad that I almost wasn't able to stand up in the wedding because I had basically had panic attacks the entire night. I was ill, it was really, really bad. And I remember there was a moment in the bathroom where I was like, just ended a panic attack. And I looked at myself in the mirror and I realized I'm about to ruin this wedding. I'm about to make something that's not about me, about me, because I am out of control. And I don't mean that to shame anyone who's struggling or even to shame my past self, but it was really in that moment that I realized this has gone further than just an inward struggle. This is something that's affecting those around me. And if I care about these people who love me, I want to be my best for them. And so that was really what propelled me even into seeking help. So it's funny if you can maybe transition your thinking, because for me, it wasn't enough to just want to get better for myself. 
I had to be motivated to get better for those around me to actually get that first push in the door to start that process. Yeah, you said something so key that you, it was like about you. That was my life story. <laughs> like everything was about me. In my head, oh, I was gonna make it about me. And so I would say that's, that's like the biggest thing that's, that's changed. And, and it's times I still gotta remind myself, it's not about you, girl. <laughs> right? It's not about you. But I know that my husband, like, I used to ask him, are you tired of me? Yeah. <laughs> because I would just be weeping and crying about something all the time. It was just, it was ridiculous. Like when I look at it, he'd be like, no, it's okay. You know, you know, so he was the one that told me I needed help. It was like, you need help too. But anyway, he kind of told me like, you need, you need help too. But it affected my husband and it definitely affected my kids. And for years, like when, when I got better, for years, I held the guilt of uh, not, not being present with them. Yeah. You know, just especially my daughter, just like not, not being there for them. And then on top of all of that, after, after God saved me, I was super religious. Like I was, I was like, it was, I was legalistic. So a lot of things that my daughter wanted to do, I didn't let her do. And it was just not biblical. It was just, you know, I was just being legalistic. And for that, for years, I felt so guilty. And that made me even more depressed and anxious. And um, even Isaiah, just, I feel like my anxiety passed down to him. So now he struggles with anxiety almost on a daily basis just to go to go a mile away you know he's still like my how you get there how you, like he's going over it over it in his head and that's because he's seen me through the years be so worried and so anxious about stuff mm -hmm. so that's a, that's the one thing we, we got to get well because people around us especially like our kids and um, you know, just our husbands, they see this and it could, it could very well be affecting them. So that's one thing we have to think about. Thank you so much for sharing it. Um, you know, I think about me, um, having young kids, I have, I got a stepson too. <laughs> um, but the ones that are with me in the house, uh, almost eight and five, my one son is very emotional. It kind of reminds me of myself when I was younger because I was, I'm still a crier, but I just was known as like the girl who cries. But when you think about it, I'm like, I was crying a lot, even before my, that was just who I was before my dad left. But then it became even the thing. And I'm like, well, it makes a lot of sense because I couldn't talk about it. So just let the tears come out. Um, but I think for my one son that's like me and very emotional, it, I didn't realize it was triggering me where I was just like, you just need to be quiet. Like it ain't that deep. Like I was doing to him what was done to me. Yeah. And again, this is not, I'm not that I, I'm not blaming my mom and those that poured into me because I look and say, okay, there's certain tools and we all make mistakes. So I want you to hear me out on that. But that was a, turn, a turning point for me to realize, like, I don't want to continue this cycle, like a generational cycle of, um, first of all, my kids feeling wrong for just not, for having a struggle. And, and truth be told, like, the beauty of Jesus is like, when you, you can see Jesus at moments had anxiety, you can see how he was like, I don't want to do, he sweat had, blood. he sweat blood, he had grief, like, all these things, but like, why do we think that we're immune from experiencing these things? And why do we feel like we're wrong for having these emotions? And I was shaming my son, for, like both of them, but particularly the one that's super emotional. And I can see how I was resenting him and almost like, I don't want to say hating him, but having a lot of resentment because it was like looking in the mirror and I, I didn't want to deal with it. And through the work of therapy, 
I can like, I'm at a place where I can enjoy him. Like, because I'm not putting those expectations on him and I'm able to sit down with him and be like, I know that was really hard for you. I feel angry too, but let's not sit in our anger. Let's think of a different way. Like I wasn't given that. And I'm like, wow. Or, or just like, I remember he did something before church on Sunday. And I said, I'm going to give you a moment to cry. I'm going to give you a moment to cry, but I still need you to be able to, we're going to have to still do those things. So just like equipping him to, to, to not squash the, the emotions, but to move in it, but with God's help and, and to let him know, like, I've got your back. So that's one, you know, there's a lot of other ways that it, um, has affected other people, but I want to transition to, we want to hear from you. We want to hear some questions that you may have. If there's something, I mean, we've kind of shared a lot, um, but if you're on Zoom in the chat, there is a link to um, a form where you can submit questions. So we want to hear from you. And Merlina, you can just shout it out because you're here. <laughs> and don't be shy. <laughs> And if you, if you even say, if you're even curious about our stories and say, hey, when you mentioned this, could you tell me, could you tell me a little bit more about that? We, we're open to that. Verlinda, did you have a question at all? Um, I guess the one thing I was thinking of, where, where do you think that comes from? Like, where do you think that Thank you for asking that. I'm going to repeat it for the people that are online. Um, Relina said, how do you tap into that joy when you're in the midst of your depression? Um, well, um, so for me, um, like I said, I was struggling with depression for um, two weeks up until Sunday. Like I was just struggling. And what I do, I use a tool. It's, um, it's called Renewing a the Renewing of the Mind Project book. And what it is, it's different questions. It's different questions about like, oh, uh, maybe I'm worried. Maybe I'm having, uh, I'm, I'm depressed because of this, because of that. And so I'll look up, I'll look up what it is that I'm depressed about. And the questions, it's like conversations of, to God, it's prayers. So it, it the questions make you it gives you God's perspective about, um, uh, it makes you think of God's perspective rather than your perspective. And then at the end of the questions, there's um, scriptures that you can pray over, pray over your life. So that's what I use to renew my mind. And I was doing it like two or three times a day. Like I was doing worry. I was doing like um, stuff concerning eating because with me, if I'm anxious or depressed, I run to food. So, you know, just questions in, along that line. But really, basically, just getting a scripture, asking God to lead you to a scripture and chewing on it, meditating it over, like ponder it in your head, looking up what it means, getting the commentary and looking it up and allowing the Lord to minister life to you through that, through that word. That's a way of renewing your mind. Another way is memorizing scriptures, renewing your mind. So it's not like one set way, but um, yeah, ask the Lord what, what he would have you to do to, um, to restore that joy. Another thing you could do is just simply turn on some praise music and start giving God the glory and praise. So it's called the Renewing of the Mind Project by Bob Relevant. I think too, uh, it's it's different for everyone. And so that's another reason why I think therapy is really helpful because you have someone walking with you and specifically finding tools that help you personally. Um, but to share from my own experience, something that has helped me was changing my surroundings. So 
if I'm in my home really, really struggling, sometimes it helps to get up, put my shoes on and go for a walk or to like go to my favorite coffee shop or just change where I'm at. Sometimes just changing that physical surrounding is really, really helpful for me to just even shift my mindset. Um, obviously it's not a, a be all and all solve, but that's typically like the first step is when I'm really feeling anxious or really, really struggling with some depression. Just even, even going to a different room in my home can be really, really helpful to just get in that mindset of, okay, I'm focusing on helping myself right now. So I'm going to go to the kitchen and get myself a really cold glass of water. And just like small actions that bring a sense of feeling, um, you know, that I was productive, <laughs> that I succeeded at something, you know, so setting those small goals has been really helpful for me. And just um, because something that I think a lot of people will struggle with too is just kind of catastrophizing of, you know, you are feeling one way. And so then you just start spiraling down. Of, this is going to turn into this and this is going to turn into this. And just so focusing on those small goals of I'm going to go on a walk and listen to my worship playlist and just take some moments to breathe in the fresh air and really listen to my music and pray to God. And even if I don't have the words, just listening to the words and letting them soak in. And even if it's just five or 10 minutes, sometimes that just change of scenery is, was really helpful for me. That's good. Thank you for that. I was thinking too, when you were talking to Megan about just like celebrating the small wins, you know, if there's a day that your depression is so strong that you cannot get out of bed, because I think back to like when my kids, when my kids are still young, but when I had shared how I would wake up every day, and it would be dread. I would just be like, I, I just want to put the covers over my head and go back to sleep. And I think that when you, when you make a small victory, whether it's like, you know what, I did change, I did change my routine or, you know what, I'm going to do something that I used to like, but I don't really like anymore. I'm just gonna try to re-engage with it. Or I just hope for, even if it was one second, <laughs> you know, even if I catastrophize the, the rest of the day, but there was a moment where I had a little hope, like just rejoicing in that and taking that to the Lord and like, a and, and I think like sometimes I used to think prayer had to be this like long drawn out thing. It doesn't, it can be simply like, you know, God, thank you right now that I was able to get out of bed. Thank you for that. Thank you for that victory. Thank you, God, that I was able to, you know, you talked about with food, like I was able to keep something down, you know? So, and that leads me to on Sunday, the, the therapists were talking about gratitude and just having a daily practice of gratitude. That's something that I try. I have a, a reminder in my phone where it's like, it says nightly gratitude. That's all it says. And I stop no matter where I'm at. And, and not tr true transparency, sometimes if I'm angry in that moment, I hit snooze. <laughs> I'm like, you can come back to me an hour. <laughs> but, but I do it and I just stop and I go, okay. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna thank you. I try to do like three things, but even if it's one, I'm just like, okay. And it really does help. The other thing, that I do, that I have a love-hate relationship with is right. Because sometimes in my depression or whatever emotion that I would be feeling or anger or despair, um, I wouldn't, I, sometimes because of my history of not using my voice and not giving that space to say I'm hurting, this is harder for me. I'm, it's gotten a lot easier, but it's harder for me to vocalize out of my mouth this is what's going on. But when I pick up pen and paper and start writing, it's like a deep, it's like a spring starts flowing up. And I'm like, oh, I didn't, yeah, I'm feeling that too. I didn't realize that I was feeling that. And then it's like the songs. You start writing and then you're like, I'm so angry with you, God. But great is your faithfulness. Like I'm alive. Like David, you yeah. end up like somehow the Holy Spirit through your writing takes you back to hope. 
And so, yeah, that's that. Those are some ways. And I think another practical way, um, like last, well, we my family had COVID, so we were stuck in the house for a while. And I remember, like, after we things started opening back up for us, I was feeling just like down. And I really like my house, but I went and took a walk. And I walked back in the house. And I was like, what? I feel so good. And it was just, I needed to just, again, change up the, the, the circumstances. Yeah. Any questions? Or anyone? I think um, also, if you really, really struggle with praying in those moments, I did something similar, but I would write letters to God. Yeah. So I would try, it's for some reason that was easier for me because sometimes it felt like if I was writing something, I kind of felt like I had to make it beautiful or it had to sound a certain way. But if I was just writing a letter, you're just telling someone what's going on. And so I would pretend <laughs> that I was telling God what was going on and how I was feeling in this letter. And it would just format it like a letter, like, dear God, today. And that really just helped me too because you're pouring it all out. And it really opened it up so that eventually I started just kind of doing that without having to write it down. And it sort of became just this continuous wow. prayer of throughout the day when I would start to struggle, I would just say, hey God, this is what's happening right now. And just start telling him. Oops. And I think just having that communication with the Lord helped me because I didn't feel alone because I think those moments, especially with depression is very isolating. You are tempted to draw inward and to retreat back, especially for me, my like default is to just like sink into myself and like, I call it the chasm inside me. And it forced me to flow outward because I was telling God what was going on. And it just became then the response I had and I think that was helpful for me. And another thing was last year when we were going through um, what's the, right? uh, the book, the Bible study we did. The rally. The yes, the yes, yeah. the rally. Oh, yes. The process of writing down. So you start with like, this is what I believe. So for me and my anxiety, a lot of times it was, you know, I believe everybody hates me or something like that. <laughs> and then writing down the truth. Yeah. Well, is it really that everybody in the world hates yeah. Megan Bladel? Well, no, that's not the truth, but it is how I'm feeling. And so it helped validate, like, this is what's going on right now. I feel very alone, but it's not the truth. Mm. And going through that process. So I would say if you weren't involved last year with Rally, um, ask one of us about it, because that was really, really helpful for me, um, just that the steps you had to go through, you know, writing down this and then listing this was, was really good for me. You know what you made me think of is like, we need to put our, our thoughts on trial because oftentimes we think our thoughts and feelings are reality. And some, sometimes they are, and sometimes they're not. And, and it's not until we um, have that self-examination that or not self-examine, you told me examine the thoughts, like you said, yeah. that you're able to have a little perspective on it and be like, oh yeah, no, like this isn't reality. Or I do, you know, I do feel this and it's okay, but my perspective needs to change. And then you're able to see God different. I love that you said the letters started off as like this thing, yeah. it turned into prayer. So you see that you take those small actions and then they morph into something else. Okay, so once I had a question and um, for those that just joined too, we're in just Q and A right now. And if you see in the chat, there's a link for you to submit a question. So someone said, you mentioned saying you trust God, but knowing deep inside you don't. How do you learn to fully trust and lean on God? Ooh. Ooh. Who wants to start with that? Good question. So what I would say is um, it's, a, it's a journey. Yeah. It's a walk. And I think like, and, and also you can be in seasons where you just trust in God, you believe in by faith. And then in other seasons, you you just have doubt. I think doubt is a part of our is a part of our Christian experience. Like that's that's just a part of our human experience. But it doesn't change because we're we're Christians. You know, so I think it's it's just walking with the Lord. 
you know, daily, just doing those spiritual disciplines, being faithful to them. And I'm gonna tell you, being in a word and being in prayer, even when you don't feel like it, that stuff help you. It helps you to believe. Faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It is so true. So I would say that like, it's, it's a step-by-step -step process, but it's also a, a surrendering of yourself in, a, in, in, in those times when you don't feel like getting in the word, when you don't feel like praying, even in those times when you don't feel like it, because I do have times when I don't feel like it, I just listen to worship music all day long. I will, and that would be ministering to me because I don't feel like I'm tired um, physically and mentally and spiritually, just tired. And God will speak to me through worship song. So I just think that it's, it's, a, it's a journey. It's, it's, not a, it's not really a definite answer, answer for that. Like, because everybody is different, you know, everybody's different. So a passage of scripture I really love that I feel like relates to this is Mark 9, when Jesus um, is speaking to the father of the boy with an unclean spirit. And the crowds are watching, this boy is convulsing on the ground and everything. And Jesus asks the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire, into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said, if you can, all things are possible for him who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. And then Jesus ends up casting the unclean spirit out of the boy. And I always remember that. And I think in those moments where you know that you need a greater trust in the Lord, just crying out to him and saying, I believe, but you have to help my unbelief because we can't conjure up some sort of trust or perfect belief in God. We're human. <laughs> we struggle with sin. We struggle living in this world. And, and there is a brokenness and a distance from God because of sin. And so just crying out to him and saying, I believe, help my unbelief. And just depending on the Lord to be faithful to play his role because he is the one through his Holy Spirit who is sanctifying us and drawing him to himself. And so we are willing and we're crying out to him. He honors that. And just instead of beating ourselves up for being like, oh, well, I should have perfect faith, going to him anyways, and just saying, I believe that you are there. Help my unbelief. Going is, is, is faith. Like, half the just, oh, yeah. yeah, Angie said going in faith. I was thinking about like for the women that were at our event on um, last Saturday, I don't know, uh, something in Exodus 6 that we talked about was like God told Moses that he was going to deliver the people of Israel. But when he goes to Pharaoh and Pharaoh, Moses goes to Pharaoh and Pharaoh doesn't respond, Moses is like, you said you were going to deliver and you're not delivering like this is Danielle's version you know? <laughs> like he he was like you said you're, he was upset and God did not turn him away mm. and like what you're saying is like what we read like God did not Jesus did not turn this man away because his lack of unbelief like his, his lack of belief he was like okay here's the response and bam, I'm still healed. Yeah. And that's what we talked about this past Saturday of like, God, he didn't shove Moses off and say, no, I understand you're angry and you don't believe me. I'm not going to save the pe people. He was like, okay, let me remind you what I told you about yeah. before. I'm going to tell you who I am. I'm going to tell you my plan and I'm going to move forward regardless of how you feel about it. So I think the hope for the person that asked that question is like, God knows he knows the desires of your heart. He knows that you want to lean into him and trust him. And he's moving forward and working that out. So don't be discouraged in that. So for me, one of the personally, one game changer for me, like I can look back in my walk with the Lord and be like, oh yeah, this shifted. Like maybe a couple of years ago, I did this study called, who do you say that I am? by um, Becky Harlan, and I love it. I gave it to like so many people. I was like, you should do this study, this is amazing. 
And what it goes through is the I am statements of Jesus. I am the bread of life. You get to know who Jesus is and God's character. And if there's something, I'm going to say something and I don't want it to come off offensive or shaming. But I think a lot of times, Megan, you talk about, you realize like, wait a minute, I'm about to ruin this wedding. This is, I'm making it about myself. And, and, and the relationship that God has with us, yes, it is kind of, some of it is about us, but it's actually us getting to know him, us getting to worship him, us being in relationship with him. And we can't do that fully if we don't understand who he is. And it, it hit me. I'm like, oh, I've been a Christian for a while, but like, I've been told from the pulpit what, who Jesus is. I, yeah, I kind of digged in a little about who Jesus is. I see what the world tells me who Jesus is, but who do you, who, who are you? What does your word say? So I started to really dig in to God's word and, and it blew my mind. It broke down misconceptions I had about God. It showed me his heart. It built my faith because I was like, man, God, you awesome. <laughs> like you really are who you say you are. And especially as women, like one of the heartbeats of the women's ministry is to kind of debunk things that women have been taught about Jesus's heart towards women. Because if you think about our society and when you think about the biblical, like, um, I don't say biblical, when you think about the, the society that was happening in Bible times, Women were not valued. And truth be told, we're kind of second class citizens in, in the society. Like, I don't know, it's like kids are like my sons. I'm like, I try to be a strong woman of God in front of them. And they're like, oh, girls can do that too. I'm like, yes, yes, they, like it's just sin. But I started, if I'm in all transparency, there was like this struggle that I had because I was like, well, God, you love my husband more. You know, like, you don't really love me as much. But then when I started to go through his word and another great study called Jesus and, and Woman and Women um, by Christy McClellan, McClellan, whatever, Google it, um, that helped me to see Jesus's heart for women and how he always came to, to take women from a place of shame and raise them to a place of honor. And that built my trust. And continues to build my trust in the Lord. Going off kind of something you were mentioning too is um, even if you don't have the all of the faith you want, being faithful to go to the Word yes. and go to God in prayer and come to church on Sunday and commune with fellow believers, even doing that when it doesn't feel like maybe exactly what you want to do or you don't you're feeling dry because i do think we go through seasons of dryness choosing to do that anyways the lord meets us in that in those places and the holy spirit is there and i mean there's a reason why worshiping with fellow believers in this room on a sunday morning is so powerful to our souls because we're being fed and you know, I always think if you're hungry, but you never go to the table to eat, come on, girl. Why are we wondering why we're still experiencing hunger pain? Come on! And so, in those moments where we're really dry, we have to go to Jesus, who's the living water, to quench our thirst. Yes. And even if we're struggling to believe that He will quench our thirst, go anyways. Oh. Go oh. get a drink. You know, and, and I think that's the beauty of the, I believe, but help my unbelief is I'm coming anyways. I'm not sure if you'll show up because deep down, I just don't know, but I'm coming anyways. So please show up. And he does. Amen. I wanted to ask something. Do we have any other questions? Um, the, the, I'm so excited about what you oh, said. Yeah. I couldn't even handle myself. Um, I think the other thing, too, we all have had this experience where you're like, I don't feel like coming to church today. I don't feel like going to community group or I don't want to, I have this like one-on-one -on -one lunch date with somebody that I don't really feel like doing. And then you show up and you get blessed. And you get blessed. <laughs> like God meets you in that. Yay. But think about how many times we miss out on God feeding us because we won't move. You know, sometimes I really think, this is just my personal opinion. Sometimes I really think God is like, 
I know you're weak. I know you're struggling. But all I need you to do is just get up. Just come. Just come to me. I got the rest. I got the rest. Just the act of faith. You talk about um, trust. Sometimes the act of trust is getting up. Yeah. Just going and moving. Okay, so the next question. And y'all are so lovely for, for, I'm just excited about this. Yeah. <laughs> Pause for a second for asking this question. One of the things that we're trying to do um, as a women's ministry is to provide more of this for you. So on a probably monthly basis, we're going to do these round tables where you can show up in person or you can show up on Zoom. And tying into this whole talk about mental health is like the next edition of our magazine is rebuilding our mind, bodies, and uh, emotions. Is that so? Emotions. <laughs> emotions. And in between that, if you're on Facebook and we're putting the videos on YouTube, we're focusing each month on different parts of rebuild. Um, what was it? August, I can't remember the month, was rebuilding your identity. Um, this past month is rebuilding our devotion. So some of these things are tools that we're just trying to get out to you to, to encourage you to come alongside of you. And we'll send that information out as well. Okay, so the next question is, what is a good prayer to start with if you feel, oh, God abandoned, I feel abandoned by God? I guess I was meant to read that one. Yeah. Um, I'll let you read the next one. because I don't even read the author. Okay, so as someone who has been, like felt that, it sounds weird, it's just to say it. Like, I feel abandoned by you. And, and it, depending on your church background or whatever, sometimes you might've been taught there, you don't say certain things to God. You don't, yeah. you know, you can't really, no, just, I feel abandoned. I feel like you left me and you, you just tell him like those raw, honest emotions. And in that talking, that is prayer. You don't even have to be on your knees like with your hands closed and being like, this is how I feel. You could just be, um, like I had shared when I was the good, good father song and just having a whole argument with God during worship. In a way that's, that's prayer. That's me talk. Prayer is talking to God, is listening to him, having that conversation. So I would encourage you, you feel abandoned by God to tell him, tell him. And the, and the thing about it, it's going to be hard because you feel abandoned. So you don't want to talk to him about it. But he wants to talk to you about it. He want he he already knows that you feel it. So he's like, come on, let's dialogue about this thing. And isn't that cool? Because he will dialogue with you, which showing that he's he's there. He's there. I think for me, um, just reading through the Psalms and actually reading them out loud as a prayer, because someone in the Bible who often felt abandoned by the Lord was David. And there are a ton of psalms where he is just pouring out his heart and he's saying, why have you forsaken me? You know, my enemies are saying, where is your God? And he's honest and vulnerable with the Lord. And then there's also psalms where he's praising God and he's recognizing God's faithfulness and his steadfast love for us. And that has been so monumentally helpful for me is to just I don't always have the words, especially when you are feeling abandoned by God or you feel like he's deserted you. It's like, I don't even know what to say to you. Right. So reading someone else's words that have already been written down is so helpful. Another one was um, the Valley of Vision, which is a book of Puritan prayers. I love those. They're really old tiny, so some of the English is a little wonky, yeah. <laughs> but that was really helpful for me too, because a lot of them talk about being in the deeps. And that's something that I think we can relate to is that feeling of being abandoned as you feel you're in the deeps, in the bottom of a pit. And once again, just reading out loud these prayers of faithful Christians who have gone before us, you feel ministered to through them. And it helps draw you closer to the Lord is just even just reading those out loud when you don't have the words yourself. Um, I think um, for me, like my uh, advice would be, so I just started um, praying through the book of Genesis and what's been really sticking out to me is something that Yale said about um, how God feel about women 
and I'm reminded of Hagar. So y'all know the story of Hagar. Hagar, um, she ran away and God told her to go back. And, you know, he spoke to her. He met her in that place. And she did feel abandoned by God. And then when she was cast out, God came back and he spoke to her again. This, this was somebody who could have been killed. She could have been killed by Sarah because Abraham told Sarah to do as you please with her. And she could have killed her. She could have killed her, but, but God restored her and God reminded her. And she probably was a pagan woman, but God came to her and reminded her that I see you. So when I went through that scripture, God reminded me, I see you. So I could pray through that like like God, thank you for seeing me like you see Hagar. And then just recently, I read about the story of Rachel and Leah. And Leah, Leah went to the Lord and she was like, I am afflicted. And God opened her womb and he gave her all these sons. And every time he gave her a son, he declared something to her about himself. And even she didn't even see it. He declared favoritism over her. He, he declared like with her second son, he declared that I hear you. I see you. He declared with her third son, I am attached to you. And then when she had her fourth son, that's when she began to praise the Lord. But in that, God was declaring something to her every time. So when you go through the word and you see the truth, it's okay to pray it. It's okay to give God back his word. I'm like, Lord, look at Jacob. You restored him. You gave him all these goods because you saw the wrong done to him by Laban. Lord, you see the wrong done to me. Yes. You see what, what's happened to me. This is in your word. Lord, do it for me yes. as you did it for them. Those people didn't even have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. So you can pray through the word. That's what I've been doing. Whatever truth I see in that Bible, in that Old Testament, baby, I'm praying it over my life. I'm praying it over the people's lives, whoever God gives gives uh, for me to intercede for. So that's what I would encourage you to do. Just pray, pray through the Psalms. Pray like, Lord, you did it for David. You did it for so-and-so. Please just do it for me. I believe that you could do it for me. Yeah. You know, it just came in my mind, that song, I See You Do It Again. Because when he does it, sometimes you got to hold on to that one time you saw him move. Yeah. And, and um, like your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to see you do this thing again. I have prayed that thing. Like, I'm going to see you do this again. Yeah. And now I, I will watch and wait until you do it again. So, yeah. Megan, you want to read the next question? Okay, so this question is, have any of you dealt with functional depression? If so, how do you get out of it? What's functional depression? Functional. I'm not to, like, so I'm like, I think we kind of talked about like our function. Like, yeah. Or, so like you need to Google because we're coming to all that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Feel free to submit another question if we don't get this right. But I know, um, yeah, I think all of us kind of talked about in our experience of, you know, you're going through life, you're going through the motions, but you feel numb and you feel dead inside and feel very isolated and alone. Um, you want to speak to that oh, first? yeah. What is it? Okay, I mean, I don't need to go. <laughs> High functioning depression. I think you kind of, um, well, you said that right now you're you're taking medication is that yeah i mean honestly my my encouragement would just oh. be to talk to someone who understands it and who knows and who's a professional because it really wasn't until i had a really good therapist and a really good doctor who could recognize that i was actually lacking serotonin and neuropronephrine oh, wow. in my brain and that that was why I was struggling so much. And I, I really, really struggled with the stigma of medication. I, I really struggled with feeling like it was wrong or that I was like, I remember there was a lot of shame put on me by I think well-meaning people who would say things like, you don't wanna be dependent on medication. And the thing is, 
a lot of us are dependent on medications if our bodies don't work. And that's not wrong. We should be thankful to the Lord that we live in a time era where we have that available to us to use. And, you know, I always think of if there's something wrong with your thyroid and your thyroid isn't producing hormone for your body to work, you have to take thyroid medication and you're pretty much dependent on that. Or if you're a diabetic and your body doesn't produce insulin, you have to go on medication. And I think there can be a lot of stigma or that we're supposed to just power through it or, you know, eat healthy and drink lots of water and exercise and then your depression will go away. And that's not always the case. And it's not wrong if that's not the case for you because it wasn't the case for me. Um, those things help, but I also needed the assistance of other outside measures. Um, so I would, I think if you're really, really struggling in that place and it's actually inhibiting your daily life, and I, I would just encourage you to talk to someone who knows about it and understands how that works in our bodies because we're holistic beings and what's affecting us emotionally and what's affecting our souls also affects our physical bodies and what's affecting our physical bodies also affects our emotions and our souls. You know, we're intertwined. Uh, and so just talking to someone and even talking through someone like a doctor or a psychiatrist who knows about it and can even just explain it to you and talk through the pros and cons. And, you know, if they think that it's a good fit for you or if it's not a good fit for you, it's just really helpful because you don't have to go through it alone. Hopefully that answers the question. That's all the questions we have. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm like hesitant to, cause I think I understand what I looked really quickly, but I'm like not quite sure about the, the functional depression. I'm going to say a book, but I, I'm going to put it out there. I don't, I didn't finish reading it. So I don't want to say, I recommend this book, <laughs> but I re, um, there was a book called, it's called Perfectly Hidden Depression. It was really eye opening because it was a psychiatrist who was studying some of, um, like some of her patients were committing suicide and it was like, she didn't see it coming. It was like, whoa, there's some of the signs that I, I didn't see there. And then she discovered there's depression can show up in different ways. And people who can um, be leading like companies and everything and look from like outside really perspective, like that they don't have depression actually do. And they're not, um, they're kind of going under the radar because of that. And it was eye-opening for me because I think when I started talking to my husband, it was like, I think I'm depressed. He was like, I don't know. Like, I mean, you could definitely see it. Like now he looks back and he's like, oh yeah, you were depressed. But some people around me didn't think that I was, yeah. but I, I really was. And it was kind of like, I don't, I don't know what else to say to y'all, but I, I'm struggling. Like, and I think that when you're a high capacity person yep. or you're a high performer type A, um, it's really easy to just mask it or just to be functioning like, at, because you're so used to function at this high level that when things are crumbling, you're like, but I should keep functioning this way. And then, and then again, stigma and shame goes to like, I should be handling this. And my therapist was super helpful because she's like, those, that's condemnation. When you're telling yourself you should, you like, why haven't you? That's shame speaking. And um, so I agree with Megan to just, you know, I'm sorry that we don't, we're probably not answering. We're, 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 not not we're not professionals, but we're going to keep it real. Like we're never going to, I don't want to, we don't want to mislead anybody. So if we didn't answer your question fully, um, maybe connect with us and maybe we can connect you maybe with one of the, um, the two of the women that were here on Sunday to kind of dig deeper into that question for you. Yeah. Anybody else? Have, Angie, did you want to add anything? Any last questions? Anybody? You can submit your question. Carolina, did you have any other questions while you're sitting? No. Yeah. No? 
So I guess, um, I guess we could close out in prayer. I just want to thank y'all for, for joining us. It really was like a spur of the moment thing. Uh, we had already planned on doing a roundtable talk on identity, rebuilding your identity, but uh, we really felt compelled after the mental health service on Sunday to just continue that conversation, to um, destigmatize it, to just, you know, we these conversations, it's like race conversation. Yeah. They're not going to be perfect. They're going to be messy. Sometimes there's going to be misunderstanding, but they still need to go on, especially in the body of Christ. So that's what we um, want it to do. And if you have prayer requests or anything like that, um, Angie, could you put your email in the in the chat right there? Angie's gonna put your her email. Everybody on here know my email. Oh well, email Angie. <laughs> <laughs> or in the private group, we have a Facebook private group um, that Megan's gonna try to link it. We're we're just gonna do more. Um, build up more support for y'all outside of the Sunday morning and our events. We want to try to fill in the gaps for y'all. So if you have prayer requests, please submit that. And I just want to thank you for um, coming and listening to our stories. I hope it really encouraged you. Thank you for the questions. I hope that it caused you to just kind of ponder on those things and, and go talk to God about it and maybe you may need to out of this say, you know, I think it's time for me to see someone. And if you need some di direction on that, please email Angie and we can provide um, some resources for you. And if you had questions about some of the books that we mentioned, because we, we did just fill out a whole bunch of resources. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you. Megan, can you close this in prayer? Father God, you are our father, and we just praise and thank you that you sent your son Jesus to save us from our brokenness and from our sin, Lord. We just recognize that we live in a very hurting, broken world, God, and that all of us have experienced things that have fractured parts of us, Lord. And we just bring all of those pieces to you, God, right now. And we lift them before you in all of their imperfection, knowing that you receive us and that you welcome us, and that you want us to come to you, God. Lord, I just pray that, you know, as we were talking about, that you would uplift us in our faith, that you would help us in our moments of struggle, and that you would silence the lies of the devil and his condemnation and shame that is telling us that we are worthless, that we're beyond saving. Because Lord, we know that, that all things are possible in you and that you can do a mighty work within us. So Lord, we just lift all of this up to you, knowing that you tell us we can boldly approach your throne of grace to receive mercy. So we pray for your mercy today, your mercy on us and your grace in our, in all of our struggles and our pains, especially when it comes to mental illness and mental health, God, we know that you care about each of those prayers, that if you clothe the lilies of the valley and feed the birds, how much more, how much more will you care for your beloved daughters, God? So we lift this up before you in the name of your son, Jesus, and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Have a wonderful night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Marlena. Yeah, Was that in person? Yes. I know. <laughs> Our one guest. Did you feel encouraged? Yeah. Good. Good. I can walk you out to the front. Sorry. Good.